Jamal. Way back and gone! Touch them all, Joe Maurer! And now these guys are making it relevant to this year's Twins. Now, our two resident hardball nerds will attempt to touch them all on the week's news surrounding the Twins in MLB. Here's Phil Mackey and Derek Wetmore. Hello, touch them all listeners. I'm Phil Mackey. This is Derek Wetmore, and we welcome you to a reckless speculation episode of this podcast. Kind of a specialty of yours lately, I've noticed. Well, I think... I think what's happening here is, especially in the dog days of Minnesota sports summer and the Twins are several games below 500, mm-hmm. let's use the Twins as a specific example. So we're recording this on a Wednesday. Wednesday today, right? It is no, Wednesday. Wednesday. We can either spend an episode talking about the surging Ira Adrianza and a clutch grand slam last night, or the Matt Belisle re-addition to the bullpen, which there are a couple interesting tentacles off that. Yeah. Or I could double down for you, and then you could react to Mission Manny Machado. Okay, all right, yeah. Obviously, I'm a little more intrigued. I'm leaning forward. You can't see me, but I'm leaning forward in my chair thinking about this second one. So I, you told me before that we were going to talk about this, and I thought, okay, well, here we go. And uh, now we're talking about it, so I want to hear your Mission Manny Machado update. Okay, so let me let me set this up. Uh, in In the game last night between the Twins and the Tigers, Miguel Cabrera suffered... Uh, a ruptured biceps tendon, which sounds terrible. Anytime you're rupturing tendons, Achilles tendons, biceps tendons, yeah, it just sounds terrible. Like if I had my choice, I would just rather not rupture anything. Yeah, that's a good point. Yeah, see, it's not about what specifically is being ruptured. It's the rupturing that's disruptive. Correct. And and so I, I, I took a scroll through Twitter after this happened, and predictably, but not incorrectly, people pointed out the fact that a 35-year-old Miguel Cabrera still has five years and $150 million more left on his contract, and if you're the Tigers, that's going to be, now that he's had a couple subpar seasons and injuries, and you kind of dug your own grave by electing to pay him until he's 40 years old. So despite the fact that we have another bad long-term contract, a bloated bad long-term contract to put on the scrap heap, unless he magically rejuvenates his career when he's 36, 38 years old, um, I still think the Twins should be unflinching if they decide to enter the free agent pool in the deep end where Manny Machado is going to be this offseason, I think they should be unflinching 10 years, 30 plus million dollars a year. And I've got four reasons on a checklist why I consider the Manny Machado contract much less dangerous than Miguel Cabrera. Sure. or Albert Pujols, or some of the other long-term contracts we've seen be absolute disasters. Yeah, and I'll let you get into these. I, I want to just quickly say that like the Twins are actually really well-positioned to try to get in on a sweepstakes like the Manny Machado, or Bryce Harper, or Clayton Kershaw if he opts out of his deal, which, I don't know, he might not now with the injuries that he's had yeah. for the Dodgers. But I think... I think this conversation might go one of two ways. And on one hand, I will say that I think to say now that Miguel Cabrera going forward is overpaid is correct. But to say that the volume of his contract was wrong, I think is maybe misguided in that, you know, as a front office, when you sign that deal, that you are hoping to cash in on one or two World Series while he is in his prime and the best hitter in baseball. And that when he's 37, he's probably going to be a bad fielding first baseman DH who maybe can't hit anymore. Mm -hmm. You you sign the Albert Pujols contract with the Angels, same thing. You are hoping to capture a World Series and say, all right, we're going to pay for this later, but we're going to reap the rewards of it now. I I mean, I think that— In both cases, they came up— Sure. The teams came up empty in the World Series department. Sure, but this idea, you're not— so. Let's let's use like you and me for example. Like you're not you're not um, paying cash for the furniture in your house. You're putting it on a credit card on some like zero percent financing for thirty six months, and you're saying that like oh well like God in three years I'll have a better job and I'll be making more money. The monthly payments will be easy, and that's what you're thinking if you're the owner of the Tigers or you know. If you run the Angels and you're saying, like, hey, baseball-wise, when he's 39, Albert might not be the prince anymore. But right now, damn it, he's a hitting machine, and we're going to try to win a World Series. That's what those contracts represent. So so I just want to say that before we get going on this Manny Machado thread, it's not always about saying, oh, is this going to look good at the back end of that deal? Almost inevitably it won't. You're hoping that it looks so good on the front end that you don't care about the rest of it. So – 
you're seventy five percent right, and I'm so that, that's a really good segue. If you think I'm seventy five percent right, I'd like to learn the one quarter <laughs> that you're wrong about. Well, hold on, yeah, I think I think here. you'll see where. I mean, you and I have pretty similar visions on this. I would say that just because you think you're going to get value the first part of a contract, and and you know when you sign it, oh well, th- th- we're probably going to really have to pay a punishment yeah. or there's or interest at tax. the back end of this deal. Um, I don't think just being aware of that makes it okay because the Tigers are still going to have to have a $30 million albatross yeah. on their books, and I get that there's no salary cap, but these teams have glass ceiling salary caps. So I think, I, in my mind, most of the time, signing a, a an 8, 9, 10-year contract or signing a guy through that many years of, of his baseball life is is 90% of the time it's bad. It's guaranteed money, and it and it turns out where the team hates it at the end of the deal. Yeah. And I think that's because most teams – aren't looking at the right checklist. I've made a checklist. If you're a team, the Twins, who've already made a nine-figure offer to a free agent this last winter, which is the first in, as far as we know, in franchise history, to you, Darvish, um, it sounds like they're willing to play around in the nine-figure pool. Now, that's that's toward the shallow end of the nine-figure pool. Manny Machado might be closer to the deep end, but these are the four items and the four criteria for Long-term contracts in baseball, if you can't check all four of these boxes as a front office when evaluating the player, don't sign the contract. Okay. All right? Okay. And and this productivity is assumed here, okay? So we're t- productivity is not one of the checklist items. Sure. You can't. The guy's a really good player, and yeah. that's a prerequisite, okay? Yeah, okay. All right. All right. Checklist item number one is age. Once a player turns 34, 35 years old, all bets are off. Sometimes you get lucky with an Adrian Beltre, and at 40 years old, he's still really good and plays really good third-base defense, and still hits 300. Lately, he's been banged up a little bit more, but sometimes you get lucky. More often than not, once a guy gets to be 34, 35 years old, that's pretty much the end of it in terms of high-level productivity. That you don't count on that production is what you're saying. Exactly. Okay. Miguel Cabrera is 35 years old. The Tigers are paying him until he's 40 years old. Mm. So that five-year, $30 million a year for five years, that's on them. Yep. So they have signed up for five years after the cliff, essentially. Manny Machado is 25. He's going to be 26 years old in July. So his best years are still either ahead of him or he's just entering his best years if you look at the natural curve of a baseball player's prime. And a 10-year contract from this winter all the way through uh, the end of the contract would take him up to the cliff but not too far over it. You might get a couple years that are dicey, but much better than five years that are dicey and paying a guy until he's 40 years old. So age is huge in this equation. Mm -hmm. If a guy is 29 or 30 years old and you're thinking about eight, nine, ten years to beat the other teams that are competing for him, you know that half of that contract's a disaster. If a guy is 26 years old, there might be certain portions of the contract that are a disaster at the end, but for the most part, you're going to be paying for the prime years of a guy's career. Uh, Let me get... I'll let you get to your second point here, but... That is a moving target to me because if you're 29 and you're looking to sign somebody for a nine-year contract with a mutual option at the end of it just for good measure, okay, well, that market is pretty well set. You know which teams will be in on it, and you know kind of how much people have to spend or how much they think they have to spend. They're projecting forward, and that price is – considering the aging curve. Every front office is considering the aging curve. So then at 26... Most are ignoring it with those contracts, though. Like Robinson Cano's contract. I don't think the they're Mariners ignoring it. The flat ignored it. I don't think so. I think they say we have a championship window. Let's get in this star player. And you look at the dynamics of the front office at the time, they were probably playing for their jobs. And as we've come to learn, Jerry DePoto sure. comes and replaces them. It's very easy to put things on your credit card when you know that somebody else is going to have to pay that's a, for it. That's a fair point. So that's what I, I'm saying. Ignoring it in the sense that they just figure, well, we're not going to be. It's, it's not going to be relevant to our decision making right. process because we're probably not going to be around. Factoring this in, sure. we'll still make this "quote unquote" bad decision or like mm-hmm. not very prudent decision. And I guess I'm speaking on behalf almost of fans as well who are sure. still going to be around at the end of those contracts. Oh, sure, so, absolutely. Yeah. And I think that matters for team building too. You might say. Hey, for five years of this contract, if he's 30 years old, and we're going to give, for some reason, we're only talking about 10 year deals here, which are exceedingly I rare. Think, I think Machado's going to get an eight to 10 year deal. Okay, and fair. So that's why we're talking about it. But let's yeah. say a 10 year deal uh, at 30, you're going to say, we've got five championship shots. We better load up. And then we've got five years where we're paying the carnage of that, you know, 
It's it's Ryan Suter and Zach Parisi. Hey, let's change the course of our franchise. We take a couple shots at the cup, and then we're going to be paying them until they're seventy four and seventy five years old, it respectively. Like you're operating under the notion that you don't care if a contract gets bad at the end, and I'm operating under the notion that I do care. I care. But I think that it's all factored into the math. I don't think some team is going to say, like, oh, Manny Machado is a better 10-year deal than somebody who signs when he's 31 because it's more likely that it will be good at the end. You're paying for that. There, there's a reason. Are you, though? If, if Albert Pujols is going to make— What do you think Manny Machado is going to make so this hold on, year? Let's, let's take Albert Pujols as an example. So, and, and, and maybe the Angels maybe the Angels didn't factor it in. But Pujols is like a two-win player, which would have been pretty predictable if you knew the guy had foot problems in St. Louis. Yeah, he might the be guy plays a, non, a non-premium position. Yeah, um, so he's a DH slash first baseman with declining numbers, as most players would after the age of thirty-five. Yeah, they're paying him what's a win above replacement now seven million dollars. So they're eight. paying him eight. So they're paying him like a four-win player. Yeah, and he's not going to be a four-win player. Yeah, right. pretty much any year after the second year of his contract with the Angels. Yeah, but so what do you think Manny Machado is going to make? I think that's central to this question. If, if you said ten years and thirty, I think it's going to be more than that. I think he's in the conversation for four hundred million dollars, as is Bryce Harper, and that's what I'm saying is that like you can't just say I'd rather pay a twenty six year old ten and thirty or you know ten and three hundred as opposed to a thirty one year old. You'd rather pay him ten and three hundred. Yeah, obviously. Everybody would, but the price tag is different. You're going to go get a different, like... But but my grand point here with the okay. age, and there's three other ones, is that people lump in long-term contracts in one bin in baseball, media and fans. Sure. And they say, boy, and I, and I say this more often than not, because more often than not, the guys who are signing the contracts came into the big leagues when they were 22 years old, yep. and they hit free agency when they were 28 or 29, and then yep. you're debating whether to pay them when they're 36 through 39 years old. Yeah. And so more often than not, the length of contract, 8, 9, 10 years, turns out to be a lot of wasteful money at the end. Agreed. And, so, and I think a lot of people just say, in general, 8, 9, 10-year contracts are always bad. Always bad. Not factoring in the small handful yeah. of guys like Harper and Machado who got into the big leagues when they were 19 yeah. and hit free agency which three years earlier than everybody yeah. else, which okay. means, you know what I'm saying? Same point. We're, we're, we're agreeing on that. For sure. I think that you and I are just sort of like slightly different shades of gray. So, sure, sure. 26 years so, old, that's a good thing. I've got three other checklist items, and I think the Twins should... Let's, we'll, we'll get to them after this break. And I think the Twins should be players for Manny Machado this offseason. Luther Brookdale Toyota is a huge player in the car dealership and service department industry in the Twin Cities. They are the main sponsor of the Touch em All podcast and one of the main sponsors of the Mackey and Judd show. Uh, we appreciate all their help. If you're looking to get into a brand new 2018 RAV4, one of the best SUVs in the world right now, you can get into a 36-month lease, $259 a month, no money due at signing, which means you go in, you get a test drive, and the fine people, my friends in that showroom area, will get you the keys and the paperwork, and you don't even have to bust out your wallet or your checkbook. Well, you have to give them your ID, but that's pretty much it. Um, it's uh, it's a great place that my family and I have been going to for 30-plus years, 694 on Brooklyn Boulevard, and LutherBrookdaleToyota.com. PaintsEnd.com, your one-stop shop for all your house painting needs without ever leaving home. PaintsEnd takes all the stress out of getting your house or apartment painted, interior or exterior. Skip the hassle of finding and scheduling painters, waiting on contractors, or getting inconsistent work. Receive a fast, free, guaranteed quote online in just minutes at PaintsEnd.com. PaintsEnd's friendly staff will guide you through from start to finish, either on the phone or online, and offer a 100% satisfaction guarantee. Get inspiration and assistance with color selection, free swatch samples, and color consultations. And fully vetted, licensed, and insured on-demand painters can get started in as little as 48 hours. Listeners to this podcast will receive $100 off their next paint project by visiting paintzen.com forward slash podcast and using promo code podcast. Visit paintzen, P-A-I-N-T-Z-E-N dot com forward slash podcast for your $100 discount count today conditions apply get the job done with high quality at the right price at paintzen.com forward slash podcast with promo code podcast paintzen the easiest way to get your home painted all right are you ready for the other three manny machado 
slash any player who you're considering signing to a massive deal checklist. I item. think that I'm ready, but I thought that I was ready for the age thing, and I couldn't let that go. So, But I don't know if we even really disagreed on the yeah, age thing. Not. We talked for a, a long time, back and forth at each other, for two people who basically <laughs> no, we, agree. We flushed out a lot of stuff. It was important to flush that stuff out. <laughs> okay, then I'm ready. <laughs> so number two is position matters a lot more than people factor in when it comes to these contracts because different positions – and the type of players that play at different positions offer up different levels of risk. So signing a pitcher to an 8, 9, 10-year contract at any age has a lot more risk than most position players because if your elbow blows out or your shoulder goes, yep. it's just sort of a it's, a it's a wild card that can just be thrown on the table at any given time. Hey, Dallas Braden, your shoulder's done. Sorry, buddy. Glenn Perkins, your shoulder's done. Sorry, buddy. You're done. Or, hey, your elbow is messed up, and now you're going to miss almost two full seasons because of the timing of your Tommy John surgery. Sure. Trevor May, we see it happen uh, with, with a bunch of players. Shohei Otani has a possibility now. He might not be back until 2020. Exactly. So pitchers can be dangerous. Catchers are dangerous in that their lifespan at that position is much shorter. Usually once you get to 31, 32, your offensive productivity drops off. Um, you're, just, you're probably not going to stay at that position long term, and then your value goes down. We saw it with Joe Maurer, for instance, yeah. with the $23 million contract. And then I would add outfielders to the risk pile, too. Not because of injury, but because their main skill set to stay at that position, especially center field, is range and speed. Okay, And sure. speed deteriorates as you get into your late 20s. So Torrey Hunter signs a contract with the Angels as a center fielder. Three years into that deal, he's a right fielder. Did they account for that? Did they pay him as a center fielder? You have to factor it in. Manny Machado is a third baseman. Shortstop slash third baseman. Let's call him a third baseman yeah, long term. I think he's a third baseman. I do too. And he would be with the Twins too. Yeah. Because uh, Royce Lewis is going to be their shortstop at some point. So the risk of a of a career-altering injury, he did have the knee thing in 2014, but yeah. the risk of a career-altering injury is much lower at that position than some of the other ones. And you, sure. can, you, can, you can rest a little easier that he's going to fill out the rest of the contract. Okay, yeah, I'm on board with I'll, you there. I'll fly through the other ones, and then we can react here. Um, uh, checklist item number three, what kind of physical shape are you in, and what's your injury history? So... Prince Fielder weighed 300 pounds and was a vegan who must have drank shots of ranch dressing all day. Like, Prince Fielder wasn't going to be productive when he was 40 years old or 36 years old. Uh, Joe Maurer has had knee issues and back issues and and it plays a physically taxing position, at least he did when he caught. Miguel Cabrera, not the fittest guy, not in great physical shape. Manny Machado, supreme physical condition. He's like 80 pounds lighter than Miguel Sano at the same position. And he never really misses games outside of the the three months he missed one of his seven seasons in the big leagues. Uh, And then the fourth one would be work ethic slash leadership. You don't want to sign a dud who's going to have a career season, take the money, and then just get fat and happy the rest of his career. This is a little tougher to gauge, but and you covered Manny Machado, but everything that you hear around the league and everything you read about Manny Machado is the guy's kind of a machine. Um, He's a driven dude. Super passionate, sometimes to the point of getting in altercations with the Kansas City Royals and mm-hmm. uh, was it the Yankees, or the Red Sox, whatever the Chris Sale thing that happened. Yep. Um, so if Sox. you can if you can check the age box, the the positional box, what kind of physical shape slash injury history do you have, and are you a leader slash what's your work ethic? Those long term contracts become much much less risky. Yeah, uh, every team in the league is thinking about the same checklist, and so that drives up the cost. If everybody thinks you check those boxes, which I'm not sure on the leadership thing, to be honest with you. I only covered him for one summer, and I was like an intern at MLB.com. So it's not like I was, you know. And he was also like 20. He was 20, and he was very deferential because he had to be. Like it was, it was at the time people in Baltimore were saying like, next A-Rod, but this team right now belongs to Adam Jones and Chris Davis and Jim Johnson, and, and on and on and on. And that was, a, that was a, an interesting and fun clubhouse to cover. But Manny was sort of just like this quiet rookie and, and deferential on purpose. And it was Buck Showalter's influence, I'm sure. But so, like, I don't have a ton of insight into, like, what he's like behind the scenes, mm-hmm. you know? But I, I don't know. I would question that fourth one. The, the only thing that I'll say as, like, an umbrella point is that if the Twins are considering this— you know every other team in baseball is considering it, and they're all weighing the same thing. So they're not trying to decide, is this guy somebody to bet on? What they're trying to decide is, 
is this someone to bet on more than every other team is willing to bet on him? Or maybe it's not about money. I'm going to guess it's about money. Well, but maybe there's, a, there's a prerequisite line in the sand sure. financially. I'm Let's sure just that pretend. him and his agent have, <laughs> have drawn. But yes. Let's just pretend that like this is a bidding war for all intents and purposes. And I think one of the things you talked about with age is like this idea of winner's curse. Like if you win an auction, you by definition were willing to pay more than everybody else and you're the, you're much more likely to be unhappy with your purchase. And I don't know that that exists in baseball free agency. I don't know that it counts for 26-year-olds, but everyone considering those factors then drives up the price and that to me is the central question. Do you want to pay 10 years, 11 years and 400 million dollars for a third baseman who can hit, but who's also had extended stretches in his career where he hasn't hit? And that's a big price tag to pay. Or would you rather go to Eduardo Escobar and say, like, hey, we'll give you three years and $50 million, and hopefully we'll just take a little shot with this, but but give ourselves some flexibility here. I'm not saying that I'd bet on Escobar over Machado. I mean, I, I don't know that you'd compare those two. And certainly they're not going to get the same length of contract here because of track record and all of that stuff that we've talked about in every single episode. But to me... That's the question is like, are you willing to pay more for this package of goods than every other team is? And is it worth it to you to give up on some of the other paths that you could take? Because signing Manny Machado, to me, while there's a ton of talent um, concentration, you guarantee that one of the 25 members of your roster is very talented, you know, six win, seven win, eight win, nine win player or whatever you think he is. Yeah, but... You know, you've already got like a four win player, you know, and maybe you like Nick Gordon next year and that factors into your infield. Maybe you're still factoring Jorge Polanco into your long term plans. I'm not saying that the Twins should shy away from it because they have so many great players. They they won't have anywhere to play them. In fact, they should be looking to add great players right now. But it's just worth considering in the whole picket, the whole uh, picture, the whole package of do I want to sign this guy who's going to be a premium free agent. Yes, yeah, I do. Do I want to sign him more than the other teams and more than what my other internal options are? That gets a little trickier for me. Uh, I, I mean, yeah, I think we'll leave it at that because I'll, I'll, I'll leave it. This is my final opinion on it. I would, I would not hesitate to pay him $300 million over 10 years because I know what the 10 years are. What about $380 million over 10 That's years? That's where we have to talk. <laughs> okay. <laughs> because now you might get, I mean, that's where, sure. I mean, once I go to 300, maybe I don't think he's going to get 400 million. I think oh, that's, and maybe not. that's just like speculative. Remember a couple of years ago, people were floating 500 million for Bryce Harper. Well, sure. okay. Like 400 is now sort of the what if he gets pipe dream target. He's not going to get $500 million okay. unless it's on a 15 or 20 year deal. Until okay. He's 47 years old. But, um, so let's, let's a wrap on that. I'm sure we'll speculate much more on Manny Machado as, the offseason picks up, and I don't know. This is all just reckless. I haven't heard anything on the twin side that they're going to be interested in this. Worth going to 1500ESPN.com, though. Our guy Jake DePew, who covers Twins minor league baseball for us, he has five players the Twins cut bait on that could have helped them this year. He's right. And this is like guys that they cut bait on, not David Ortiz, guys they cut bait on in the last year yep. or in the offseason. 40-man roster that- decisions that have turned out really badly for them. Yes. So go check that out on 1500ESPN.com. Did you know that up to two-thirds of whole transcriptome amplification or WTA sequencing reads are spent on analysis of highly abundant gene targets, which contribute little to understanding differences between cell types? While WTA can be invaluable for discovery-based pilot experiments, there's a more cost-effective way to avoid sequencing waste and focus on the genes that matter, including rare transcripts. BD Rhapsody targeted assays are designed to lower experimental costs and increase sampling sensitivity, so you can run additional samples within budget while still generating high quality data. Find out more about BD Rhapsody targeted panels and the new BD Rhapsody single cell analysis system at bd.com.